right, we are live now. So welcome again. Our teacher looks like he's prepared. Uh, is there anything that you would like us to pray about this morning? Anything on your minds? No? Today. Okay, all right. We'll pray for that, Ann. Ann has uh, seen uh, several people uh, drop off uh, at the workplace where she works and no replacements yet, so she's having to uh, put in some extra time. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we want to gra gra just gratefully come before you and thank you for the opportunity to worship. We are here today, Lord, not just to go to church, but to worship the head of the church. And so this morning, as we hear the word, sing and pray and give and, and deliver the message of the gospel, Father, we pray that Jesus will indeed be worshiped and receive that which is his due. He is great the King of kings and the Lord of lords, he is above all. We thank you that he has deigned to make the church his body and through his spirit his home, as it were, on the earth. And may he be pleased with what happens here today. Help our brother as he teaches. We also ask for you to grant uh, aid to our sister who is uh, having to pick up this extra workload due to people who have not carried out their responsibilities faithfully or they have been sovereignly or providentially hindered from doing so and have been removed from their job uh, at the place where she works. And so we ask that you would give her strength. It was very difficult for her these last couple of days and then again she has assignment today which is not according to her desire. We pray that soon there will be others who will take up the, the role and that she will be freed from working on the Lord's day. But thank you, Lord, that she does have some employment. We pray for our other brothers in the church who need that employment as well, that you would provide for them and use their diligent means to uh, open doors as well. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, welcome, James. Good morning. We're turning again to the first book, the first chapter of the book of Nahum. That's where we'll be. We've been there for the last few times when we have had the class. And we note again the first verse, which says the burden against Nineveh the burden against Nineveh. So just for those first few words, we expect that the book is going to have a lot to say with regard to Nineveh. Nineveh, having been the capital of Assyria, and so when we say Nineveh, we are including Assyria uh, in the large and not just specifically the city itself. So what does it say here? And what do we learn in the book? One of the things that we pointed out before is that in looking at what is recorded here for us, we see something about God's character. We get to learn a little bit about this God who is referred to in this book. Now, one of the things that we, I think most of us are familiar with is the idea that people have sometimes about God, their conception of God. And in their conception of God, 
some of the expressions that are here are not included. And so those, some of those things, and we talked about some of those things before. We're going to review those briefly before we move on. In the first several verses here, we see God being referred to as jealous. We see God as being referred to as one who seeks vengeance, or one who is vengeful. We see a reference to God as furious. We see a reference to God's wrath. These are some strong words. And those are words which we also use. And sometimes we think about ourselves and those around us in terms of some of these words. Some people think these kinds of terms are inappropriate for God. They think he's, that this is just not appropriate. But they have a misunderstanding. Not we. They are the ones who misunderstand because how do we know that these are proper? We know because God has told us that. How do we know he told us? Well, we have it recorded in this Bible now. I know that many reject this document that we refer to here. That's not the point that I'm belaboring. Now, there are other things in those first verses, too, other words which refer to God. It says that he is slow to anger. Slow to anger. And it also says that he will not acquit the wicked. He will not acquit the wicked. I think in our days, and sometimes our courts, we are chagrined at how often perhaps some of the wicked ones are acquitted in that tribunal. But before God, it says he will not acquit the wicked. It also says that God is great in power. So that when you see it says he's slow to anger, it has nothing to do with a lack of power to act. He is great in power. So having those kinds of what might be termed negative words, the ones that were negative in reference to God, could kind of shade the thinking. And so we see in verse number seven, a specific declaration. It says, the Lord is good. Just in case somebody would read those first verses and have a question about that. God is good. I read some verses the last time regarding this specific thing. I'm going to read those verses again. I selected some verses. One of them is Psalm chapter 34 and verse number 8. That verse says, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is a man who trusts in him. One of the interesting things about that verse is, is that this notion that God is good doesn't have to be merely a theoretical concept to us, but it can be a reality that we have embraced and that we know by putting our trust in him. So God is good. In Psalm 100, in verse number 5, it says, For the Lord is good. 
His mercy is everlasting, and his truth endures forever. His mercy, his truth, not my truth or your truth or somebody else's truth, but his truth endures forever, and that's the only truth that matters. And I'm saying that because of what we hear in our contemporary world. In Psalm 135, at verse 3, it says this, Praise the Lord, for he is good. He is good. Sing praises to his name, for it is pleasant. These are clear texts. There can be no doubt about what those things mean. In Psalm 145, and in verse 9, we read another such expression. It says, the Lord is good to all, and his tender mercies are over all his works. The Lord is good. Listen to Jeremiah in chapter 33 and verse number 11. It says, a voice of joy and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride, the voice of those who will say, praise the Lord of hosts, for the Lord is good. And of those who will bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord, for I will cause the captives of the land to return as at the last, says the Lord. The Lord is good. Lamentations chapter 3 and verse 25. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. So the Lord is good. Now in Nahum chapter 1, when we get back to verse number 8, we get back to seeing the wrath and what it means to fall under the judgment of God for Nineveh, for Assyria. It says there in verse number 8, in the first chapter. But with an overflowing flood, he will make an utter end of his place, its place. Now we are talking about, and it's, the reference is to Nineveh. He will make an utter end of his place. Affliction will not rise up the second time. and darkness will pursue his enemies. These are some interesting expressions here. So this is the God. This is what he is determined to do with an overflowing flood. One of the things that's interesting is to understand that flooding was a factor in the overthrow of Assyria. Flooding that caused some of the walls to give way and made it accessible for those Babylonians with the Medes and others who came in and, and wrecked them. With an overflowing flood, Now, he will make another end. Darkness will pursue his enemies. One of the things that is interesting is this whole idea of darkness and God pursuing his enemies. 
And one of the things that I thought of is in warfare, oftentimes the darkness of the night brings pause to some of the action, if not most of it, because that's a hazardous time. I was reading recently some things about some of the things that transpired in, in World War II, and they talked about that. The difference between fighting in the darkness and in the night. But for God, darkness is not an impediment. Not at all. So his enemy, they will flee. They can flee into the dark, but it doesn't help. Because if God is in pursuit of them, there is no escape. So who is this God? Let me give you three verses. First Chronicles chapter 29, verse 11 says this. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness, the power, and the glory, the victory, and the majesty for all that is in heaven and in earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head over all. This God is the one who is the active God in what is happening now to the Assyrians. He has every right to do the things he's doing and it does not implicate him in evil at all because he's a just God. He's a just God. In Deuteronomy chapter 4, in verse 39, it says, Therefore know this, and consider it in your heart, that the Lord himself is God in heaven above and on earth Beneath, there is no other. Or in Proverbs chapter 16 and verse number 4. The Lord has made all for himself. Yes, even the wicked for the day of doom. Who is going to find fault with what God does? Who's going to find fault with how he deals with the Assyrians? Who is going to find fault with how he deals with us? The NET has that last verse I just read in Proverbs 16:4. In these words, it says, The Lord has worked everything for his own ends even the wicked for the day of disaster. And this section was talking about the disaster that was coming to Assyria. Now, as we continue and go back here to Nahum chapter one, in verse number nine, we see the words here. What do you conspire against the Lord? He will make an utter end of it. Affliction will not arise the second time. For while tangled like thorns and while drunken like drunkards, they shall be devoured like stubble, fully dried, from you comes forth one who plots evil against the Lord, a wicked counselor. That's really quite interesting. So we see here now Assyria in the crosshairs. In those verses there that are just read in verses 9 through 11. So who can conspire against the Lord? Who can come against him? Who can bring a charge? 
people can speak foolishly, and they do, with regard to God, but it's foolish to do that. So verses 9 and 11, Assyria in the crosshairs. He's going to bring it to an end. And once he does, Assyria is not going to rise again to cause Judah or Israel any more trouble. Not that they wouldn't have trouble after, but it wouldn't be from them. Talk about tangled in thorns and drunken like drunkards. And I think the records show that there actually was drunkenness when the people were overthrown. That's, that's really quite a, quite a telling. So devoured like stubble, fully dried. So that's just like, you know, it just doesn't have any wherewithal at all. <laughs> no stead power. It's, it's just not there. From you comes forth, from you comes forth one who plots evil against the Lord, a wicked counselor. One of the things that I thought about when I look at this, this whole notion, plotting evil against the Lord. I think that's something that is worth us really thinking some more about, the whole idea. Who is plotting against the Lord? And are they even aware who are doing it? That's the reality of what they're doing. That's a serious issue. A wicked counselor. So we see all of this with Assyria and the crosshairs. One of the things that's interesting that we note here in this book is, is that with all of this focus about this judgment that's coming upon Assyria, Assyria had been bad, but they had been safe. They had been a safe country. They had been, with, they, they had been uh, able to just not be overrun by other nations and peoples for a long time. And so Israel had had all kinds of issues. See, the northern kingdom had already been decimated by them. But Judah was still around, still available. But they still were being, uh, having a lot of problems. Uh, having to having to submit in some ways, uh, pay tribute and stuff like that. But in now in verses 11 and 12, we see a message of comfort for, for Judah. So if they trust in God, they can understand how they can stand in the midst of the trouble. If they trust in God, if they know who he is, it says here in verse number 11, though they are safe, who are they talking about? Who is he talking about? That's talking about the Assyrians. And likewise many, yet in this manner, they will be cut down when he passes through. Though I have afflicted you, Judah, I will afflict you, it will afflict you, I will afflict you no more. So this is what the Lord is saying. He's going to bring an end to the affliction that is coming from Assyria. For now I will break off his yoke from you and burst your bonds apart. A word of comfort. Something for Judah to be able to say that even in the midst of all the difficulty that we are in, God is still in control. He's still in charge. He's still 
God. That's very important to remember. So the Assyrian, the Assyrians, they had invited this judgment upon themselves that was common. And they were now approaching a time when their response was not going to be like the earlier response when Jonah preached. But it was going to be the exact opposite, and they were going to keep on down the path, and the judgment would overtake them. That's where they were headed. So then, let us press on here. It says in verse number 14, the Lord has given a command concerning you. Your name shall be perpetuated no longer. Out of the house of your gods, I will cut off the carved image and the molded image. I will dig your grave, for you are thou. God speaking about a people like that, declaring them to be a vile people. So there will be this invasion. It will come, and the people would not be able to be in a strong place anymore. Their strength would have turn to weakness. Their strength and their ability to defend and support themselves would dissolve. I want to read a few passages of scripture here to go back and tie some of this in to what some of the other prophets said. First here I will go to Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 8, look at these words here. Isaiah chapter 8 and verse, beginning in verse number 7. Now therefore behold, the Lord brings up over them the waters of the river, strong and mighty, the king of Assyria and all his glory. He will go up over all his camels and go over all his banks. He will pass through Judah. He will overflow and pass over. He will reach up to the neck and the stretching out of his wings will fill the breath of your land, O Emmanuel. Jeremiah. Let's go to Jeremiah. So we see that the activity of, of Assyria is, they were intimately intertwined with Israel and, and the things that went on with them. In Jeremiah chapter 47 and verse 2, it says, Thus says the Lord, Behold, the waters rise out of the north, and shall be an overflowing flood. They shall overflow the land and all that is in it, the city and those who dwell in it. Then the men shall cry, and all the inhabitants shall of the land shall wail. These are quite interesting expressions that we're reading here. I want to read another one here in Daniel. Actually, actually I'm not going to read that's not on point to what I was looking at. Let me see. Let 
I think I'll leave that point right where, where it is there. <laughs> so then, when the, and I, as I mentioned, when the, when the destruction came on Nineveh, or Assyria, there was the overflowing of water, the washing away of part of the walls, of, of Nineveh's walls and, and that, and they were overtaken. And then there's this expression here about the gods. Out of the house of your gods, I will cut off the carved image and the molded image. One of the things that well, is interesting is that all this whole thing about idolatry and, and all those false gods that we read about in the scriptures and all that. And, and the Assyrians had all these false gods. But from what I understand from history is, I think it's that it was the Medes who, along with the Babylonians, overtook the Assyrians, hated idols. <laughs> and so they got rid of all those idols. So the thing that Assyria had done was well, going, going to be done to them, the very same thing that they had done would be turned upon them. Back in the book here now again. So out of the house of your gods, I will cut off the carved image and the molded image. I will dig your grave for your vow. So to be caught in the crosshairs of God is a bad place to be. And there is no, there's no escape from there. Once that judgment has been declared to fall, that it's going to fall, it would be devastating. Judah would go through a lot of troubles after this. And as we know that after this, Judah kept right on down a certain path that he'd been going down. In fact, the thing that led to the destruction of Israel, the northern kingdom, was a pattern of behavior. A pattern of behavior. They had turned from God and to idols and worship and all kinds of false stuff and it got so bad that God says, well, now it's time for the judgment to fall. And so he used one of his instruments, the Assyrians, to go in and to bring that judgment upon them. Judah, what about Judah? Did Judah know what path Israel took? that led to this destruction from the Assyrians? Well, one way to answer that is by saying, not only did they know that path, they knew it very well. And not only did they know it well, they followed exactly along the same path. So they saw what happened there. They knew God was judging those people. God said he would. He said he will judge wickedness. God says the wicked will not be acquitted. Judah saw it. And so what did they do? So we know what they did. They understood the path that was being taken by Israel. And they made themselves a carbon copy and followed it along exactly the same pathway. To what result? Well, to as I've obviously, to the same result. It's still, when I think about that, I keep thinking to myself, did they really understand, did they understand that they were following right along the same path. And that God being God would give the same result. 
So what, what's going on? So they kept on my path. And God picked, chose another one of his instruments. And he said, now I will use you to bring the judgment upon Judah. And that was the Babylonian people who, army, to do to Judah what the Syrians had done to Israel. Because they chose the same path God had already declared, and it was already set, what would be the end of that path. There's no question about what was going to be at the end of the path. It just matter whether they just keep plowing on down there until they got to the end, that end, and they did. I'm going to go ahead to the last verse here in chapter 1. Behold on the mountains the feet of him who brings good tidings, who proclaims peace. O oh, Judah, keep your appointed feasts. Perform your vows, for the wicked one shall no more pass through you. He is utterly cut off. Isn't that a, a, a mighty contrast there from verse 14? Because with regard to Assyrians and their idols and their gods, out of the house of your gods, I will cut off the carved image in verse 14 and the molded image. That's what God says. So as for their idols, it would be cut off. Their ceremonies, everything that they were doing for their religious worship, cut off. But God has sent to Israel. Behold on the mountains the feet of him who brings good tidings, who proclaim, proclaims peace. O oh, Judah, keep your appointed feasts. Perform your vows. Judah, you know what you need to do. You know what the Lord requires of you. Now do it. That's what he's saying. That's a challenge. Not just to Judah. That's a challenge to us. To know what the Lord says to do and then to do it. Our Father in heaven, we thank you that you have given to us this little brief time this morning to consider a small portion of what you have for us in this, your revelation, which we, you have given to us that we might be able to learn of you, and then having learned to do. We ask in the name of the Lord Jesus, our Savior, with thanksgiving. Amen. Thank you for your kind attention.